Okay, this last little talk's called Babylon Now. If you've, some of the men have been to the teachings, so this is really an overview. I've got 10 one hour teachings on 6,000 years of Babylon. I've brought some of the tapes if you're interested. There's, there's 10 video tapes, one hour long, and there's 10 audio tapes. Tracing the, you know, the spirit of Babylon right from the seed of Cain right to the end of the world. And I'm gonna try and condense it all in half an hour. Love and worship cannot be separated. I, I'm, I'm saying that God wants love from his creation, obviously. He wants a relationship. But the relationship comes through worship. The, the, the only reason my wife knows that I love her is because I demonstrate acts of worship. Worship, definite, uh, dictionary definition, amazingly enough, has nothing to do with music. And it has nothing to do with lifting hands or kneeling on the floor. Worship means giving due benevolence. Worship means respecting somebody above you. That's why you call a judge in court. You say, yes, your honour, yes, your worship. Doesn't make him a good or a bad man. One day all the demons in hell will have to worship God. They'll bow the knee and worship, but they will still hate God's guts. Will they not? Will they not still hate God with, with a consuming hatred and yet they'll be forced to worship him? And so I believe God wants those acts of love which is worship. But God doesn't want to force us to worship, does he? And so that because God wants us to love him and worship him out of our own free will, then he reveals his character to us. In his goodness. And when God reveals his character, his love, his joy, his gentleness, it's not difficult to love God when you see him. The difficulty is seeing him. If the world could see Jesus and God, they would fall down at his feet and worship, wouldn't they? The trouble is they're as blind as that wall. They cannot see Jesus. That's why it needs a miracle of the Holy Ghost to take the blindfold off. And when people see Jesus, wow, eternal life, sin's forgiven. They will worship him. And all God has to do is reveal himself to them. We have a part to play in that to reveal Christ to them. They don't see Jesus in us. It's difficult to believe in the Jesus they can't see. They want to see Jesus in flesh and blood first, don't they? Why am I saying all this? What's this got to do with Babylon? Well, everything. Because the devil wants to take the place of God. The devil is not trying to take the place of Jesus. He wants to be in place of God. And just as God has, needs a mediator, a Christ, to show the way to God, because Christ is the only way to God, isn't he? Because God needs a mediator. The purpose of Jesus was to show us God and reconcile us back to God. And God has a Holy Spirit to convict men that Jesus is the only way back to God. So can you see how they work? The Holy Ghost is there not to speak of himself, not to say worship me, we shouldn't worship the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is to convict you of sin and righteousness and judgment, that Jesus is the only way not to himself. He said, I am the way. Well, the way isn't the end, the way is the way to the end. So Jesus says, I'm only the way, I'm not the end. The end is to be reconciled with your heavenly Father. 
And so Satan wants to be like God. So therefore he needs a Christ or an antichrist as the way to Satan. That's why Satan needs an antichrist because he wants to be like God and he wants a mediator. And as Christ died to, to bring the whole world to, to God, the Antichrist will bring the whole world to Satan. That's the idea. And the devil has got an unholy spirit, the counterfeit, the false prophet, to convince the whole world that the Antichrist is the only way to the true God, Satan. We know he's a false God, but that's the way it'll be put. Now how can we worship Satan? If Satan shows us his character, we'll run a mile. Who would worship Satan? So he cannot use the same methods as God. God can reveal his character and you say, wow. But if the devil showed himself to people, they wouldn't worship him. He's a liar, he's a cheat, he's a murderer. And this is where deception comes in. This is where Babylon comes in. Babylon is a system, essentially, of deception. Whether you think it's the, the Roman church, or whether you think it's the Mormons, or the Moonies, or the Muslims, doesn't really matter, does it? Or whether you think it's the Pentecostals. It doesn't really matter what you think Babylon is. It's a system of deception. Because the devil's got to be worshipped indirectly. But he knows that he can't deceive everybody. And so in the end, if he can't deceive you, he'll have to use force. But it's the devil's last trick. The devil doesn't want to use force. He wants you to worship him like you'd worship God out of your own free will, through deception. But he always has the backup of force. And that's why the devil wants to control the world. The devil doesn't want to control the world so he has all the power. He doesn't want to control the world so he has all the money. He wants to control the whole world, so if he can't deceive them, in the end he can force them to worship. That's why if we look at Daniel in the lion's den, it's like the middle Babylon, isn't it? We've got the, the Tower of Babel, it's the beginning of Babylon, where we understand the confusion. Then we've got the, the, the Babylon in Daniel's day, and it gives us a little bit more. It opens up the picture, and we see that music and money and, and statues are to do with it. And Nebuchadnezzar must be a type of the Antichrist. He's the king of Babylon, so he's the Antichrist. And that's why he said, look, there's a dedication of the statue. Come and worship. It wasn't force worship. He said, come to a dedication. That's pretty nice, isn't it? Let's all go to a dedication of the statue. The princes, the councillors, it was a privilege. Do you know all those people would be proud to go? We're going to the dedication of the statue. That's all right. And when he got them there on deception, he suddenly said, now it is commanded that you bow down and worship it. They didn't come to worship a statue. They come to a dedication. And he suddenly switched and says, now you're commanded. But if you don't, it's the fiery furnace. The backup of force if you don't bow voluntarily. And when they didn't bow, he said Nebuchadnezzar was livid. So he got these three before him and he put a smile on. This is a character of the Antichrist. He put a smile on. He says, hello, lads. He said, it's come to me attention that you didn't bow. He was livid. He wanted to annihilate them, but he put a smile on. He said, I've heard that you, you didn't bow. What's, what's up? Did you not understand the instructions? And he gave them another chance. Imagine that. That's the spirit of the Antichrist. He'll give you lots of chances to bow the knee because he wants it voluntarily. The force is the last step. And he says, come on, I'll give you another chance. He says, look, next time the music plays, next time you hear the music and everything, if you bow, tremendous. But if you don't, the fiery furnace. And they didn't bow. And there was no more smiles. The true colours came out then. When the, the devil realises he cannot deceive the elect, all hell will break loose. He'll try and deceive the church first. If he can't deceive it, then all hell will break loose. It's the fiery furnace. And we say hallelujah, because the fiery furnace burns all the bonds. All your little petty vices and all your weaknesses, when you get thrown in the furnace, it burns them all off. You get freed in the furnace, you know. <laughs> it doesn't harm you. 
It's the devil's equivalent of the lake of fire. He says, turn or burn, doesn't he? Worship me or burn. Now, if you're not afraid of the devil's lake of fire, which is the fiery furnace, it'll free you. If you escape the fiery furnace, you'll end up in God's lake of fire. I'd rather jump in the fiery furnace, wouldn't you, and get freed? Yeah. All the little petty differences, when persecution comes, it'll make you holy. It's wonderful. It'll just get rid of your besetting sins, that's all. <laughs> and you'll escape the real fire. The devil's a con man. He frightens you with the fire and all it'll do is burn up the dross. So the end purpose of Satan is not world dominion, it's world worship. That's what he wants. But the system of Babylon, it's a system of finance, it's a system of religion. I can't go into it all. If you're interested, you can get the tapes. But there, there are four things necessary for a one world domination. He does want to dominate the world because that's the only way to force worship. There's four things, trade. Unless you get trade, one world trade, you can't get the next one, which is finance. The third one is politics. You need one world politics, don't you? And last of all, if you're going to get one world worship, you need a one world religion. And when you've got the trade, the finance, the politics and the religion, you need one man to head them all up, the Antichrist. Don't you? Can you see how it'll work? And I've used the illustration often, but Europe is a good example because Europe had all those countries. If it could happen in Europe, it's a pattern of what can happen in the whole world. It's happening with America and Canada and different groups in the Pacific. That they're, they're getting together with trade. and Trade always starts it off. Trade is the key to start it off. And of course, the, the EC didn't start as the EC, did it? It started as the e EC. European Economic Community. Trade Community. And I remember... Before 1992, I used to go across to Holland to preach, or Germany, or Poland, or wherever. And when I got to the border, I had to declare what I had. Oh, we've got 100 tapes here, and 100 CDs. And I had to pay tax when I went through the customs. But in 1992, the barriers, were, trade barriers were broken down. I mean, when you're driving to Scotland, they don't stop your van and say what you're carrying, do they? Or Wales. Well, it's the same now. When I go to Belgium or Holland or Germany, they don't stop me and say, what have they got in your van? The trade barriers have been broken down. And I can have a million pounds worth of tapes in my van and nobody will stop me. Unless they suspect me of narcotics, that's different. But trade, I can trade over Europe now. And as soon as the trade was set up after 1992, it was very, very quickly, they dropped the EEC and called it EC. It was no, it's no longer European Economic Community. That's sewn up now, they want you to forget that. It's just European Community, because the trade's tied up, you see. We've moved a step forward, haven't we? The finance, that's going on all the time to integrate the finance. We've now got the euro, haven't we? We're still kicking and screaming our way there, aren't we? The politics, I mean, they're all going on parallel as well as in order. That There's a parallel, you know, they're all going towards it. I could say the law, the law and the politics, the legal system. Britain has lost its sovereignty, whatever the anti-European people think. I can take my, my country to the, to, to the court in Strasbourg. Do you know I can take my country to court? If my local council or the country pass a law and it contravenes the laws of human rights or any European law, I can take my country to court, to a higher court. Do you know you can take your country to a higher court? This country cannot pass any law that contravenes European law. So we're already under the one European system, whether we like it or not. We're just arguing about the Euros and petty things, but really the sovereignty is gone, legally, politically. You see, what happens, they pass lots of laws that you would rebel against and start civil war for. So they pass them, but they don't implement them for many years. But the legal is already there, they just don't implement it. You have no control of it, you're just cannon fodder. The people have never had the say, democracy is the biggest con in the world. 
You have no say at all. You don't even know the people you're voting for. You have no idea their hidden agendas. Even they don't know their hidden agendas. The politicians don't know their own hidden agendas. I'm not talking about the truth. They're completely deceived because they're trying to bring peace on earth, goodwill towards men. They're trying to play at God. Politics is trying to play at God. Democracy, dictatorship, fascism, any otherism, they're all playing at God, trying to control people. God says, I'll send my prophets and speak to you. That should be enough. But we want a king to rule over us. So they take our daughters and they put us in the army. And you know your Bibles, what happens when men set up political systems or even a monarchy. God says, I'll send my prophets and speak to you, follow them, hear my words. I want to be a king. So any other system must be demonic. People say, well, I, 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 you know, I, I always vote. I'm, I'm, you know, you've got to pick the lesser of evils. I say, I'm not voting for any evil, lesser or greater. I'm in the kingdom of God. I'm an alien. I'm, I've got an alternative. I ask people to join the kingdom of God. Not the kingdom of Tony Blair or Margaret Thatcher or President Bush. So we've got most of those in Europe, trade, finance, politics. The religion's fast coming. Don't be worried about the Muslims, will you? They won't become the one world religion. Hinduism is the one world religion. The new age is essentially Hinduism. Muhammad's only, Muhammad doesn't only believe in one God, it can't be the one world religion. All roads lead to God, it's the one world religion. Hinduism has 33 million gods. Jesus included, they don't mind putting Jesus up there amongst with them. Christianity and Islam and Judaism have to come down for the one world system, which is basically, if you know anything about the New Age, it's Hinduism. All the meditation that's come in the country, all those things, it's Hinduism. Buddhism, a form of Hinduism. Gandhi was a, a New Ager, not a pacifist. If you forget the film and reel about his life, you'll find out a lot of things you won't like about Gandhi. How violent he was. How he ordered people to be killed. Don't read the film. The Indian government paid millions of dollars for that propaganda of Gandhi with Ben Kingsley. That's not the real Gandhi. Films are never are. Films are preachers, film producers are prophets, did you not know? They're like pop stars, they're preaching a message. Surely you're not so stupid as to believe the propaganda films, are you? Hollywood's full of the occult, of homosexuality. Are they going to tell you the truth? They're preparing us for the one world. Get, get real, please, Christians. Read your Bible, that'll tell you what's going to happen. And these so-called world leaders and peace bringers, they're not peace bringers, they're ushering in the one world. Well, we've not got the one world religion yet, but it's fast growing. And we haven't got the leader of all three, the Antichrist. That's got to come. But it's getting pretty close, isn't it? World trade centres. Buzzwords, aren't they? One world family, you know, the... Global village. We're getting close to it with our talk. I'm going to miss a lot of this out. I've been missing my notes deliberately. I want to leave time for Jeff. So I'm not going to look at the Tower of Babel. The statement of Babylon is in most denominations. Christian ones. What's the statement of Babylon? Let us make a name for ourselves so we are not scattered. Let's pool our resources. Let's do this. Let's put all the churches together. We can have a bigger impact in the community. We can lobby the government. It sounds wonderful. It's actually Babylon. Let's make a name for ourselves so we're not scattered. God wants to scatter that. Because you know very well when the denomination gets financially viable, they become corrupt. The Church of England, the, the Catholic Church, whatever. They were never meant to have so much money that it corrupts them. They were never meant to have political power. The Church were never meant to have political power. It corrupts them. We're the offscourings of the earth. We're the light in the darkness, aren't we? 
You can only change something from being different from it as a Christian, not being part of it. We're in it, but we're not of it. And you've got to be outside it to change it. In the world you get in it, let's permeate it. Let's be deceitful in other words. Let's get in and try and... We don't change it that way. We change the world because we're different. Because we're holy. Because we're a separate people. Not by compromising and becoming like them. And so all, all those who stood against Babylon, whether it was Daniel or the Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they were different, they lived a different lifestyle. We won't eat the king's meat, we won't be like those people. We'll be different, we'll pray three times a day. We have a different lifestyle. They changed it by being different. Joseph and Daniel weren't in there trying to work their way up the system to influence it for God. The very contrary, they were actually slaves in the system and by supernatural dreams and revelations, God exalted them. They didn't work their way up the system. Never think that you should get into politics and these things to be a Christian influence. God took slaves and promoted them to run the empire for demagogues. That's God. Because they had supernatural wisdom and revelation, not because they were big heads and clever and politicians and financially viable. Joseph and Daniel, that people quote about getting into the world system, had an advert for the very opposite. They went as slaves. They weren't working their way up in the system, were they? The very opposite. It was the Holy Ghost giving them supernatural dreams and visions that made the king exalt them. That's what we want, Daniels and... and Joseph's don't, we're not people wordling, because when you get in the system, you've got to be corrupt to get there. You can't get to the top in politics, in music, in anything without selling your soul, because it's the devil's system. How can you get to the top in the world system if you know anything about it? Ask Gilbert about finance. You can't get to the top unless you sell yourself. Gilbert actually got demoted because he wouldn't sell himself. They demoted him. You can't get to the top of the system if you have integrity and truth. Can a politician in our country stand up and say homosexuality is wrong? Whoever stood up and that, they wouldn't be an MP for very long. How can he speak the truth? He's got to compromise and say, well, at least if we get the age of consent down to... Uh, and he's compromising right, left and centre. Have you looked up compromise in the dictionary? A parcel surrender of the truth for the sake of agreement. That's what compromise is, a partial surrender of your stand for the sake of agreement. I don't want to compromise. I'd rather be burnt at the stake, wouldn't you, than sell Jesus down the river or my brother or sister. Why can't I speak the truth? Why can't I say homosexuality is wrong according to the Bible and according to me and according to science and according to medical facts? Why can't I tell the truth? Why can't I say God hates sin, loves the sinners, I love homosexuals, I hate what they do, it's an abomination. It's filthy, it's dirty. Any medical doctor will tell you your body wasn't made for that, it's a filthy practice. If you practice homosexuality, you're not 20 years off your life, that is a proven fact. On average, you're not 20 years off your life. That's a medical fact, but you can't say that. It's not politically correct. We're in the day of compromise and deception. And if you don't deceive, you'll go in the furnace and that's all right. It'll free you. Don't fear the fiery furnace. Do not fear it, men. I'm, I'm warning you because it's coming. If you can't see that it's coming in this country, then... I, don't fear it, rejoice. When Babylon falls, we sing the hallelujah chorus, don't we? Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon in Daniel's day let us know a little bit more about the end times. And we see that statues and music have come into it. When you hear the music play, bow down and worship. Music is the key to worship. Not only of God, but the Antichrist. That's why there's been an explosion in music, where you hear music when you get in your car, you hear music in the supermarkets, you hear music in restaurants. It used to be background music where it was romantic. Now it's so loud you can't hold conversations. 
I was talking to somebody yesterday and they say they're now using music very powerfully to motivate athletes and sportsmen. Music and images and they're pounding them away. Even on the coaches going to the, the stadiums, the, the, the uh, athletes are bombarded with loud music. Eminem and, and gangster rap and evil words to motivate them, make them aggressive. Music is a tremendously powerful tool. And Babylon in Daniel's day gives us a key that music and statues will play an important part. Let me, let me just go to Revelation now because I'm saying where are we now? Revelation 13. I'm just speaking off the cuff uh, for this session. Because I've got this 10 hours inside me, if I look at my notes I'll ramble on and, and speak too long. So let's, let's get to this last Babylon and see where we are now. Revelation 13. First, we see the Antichrist, the beast rise out of the sea. I think that most theologians, you know, I don't want to disagree with people, I think most people agree that that beast coming up out of the earth with the seven heads and the ten horns, they believe that's the Antichrist. So let's, let's pass over that. But there's another image comes out, isn't there? Verse 11. And I beheld another beast. Now I believe that the, the first beast is the Antichrist. I believe the second beast is the Anti-Holy Ghost. In other words, the false prophet. There's always a hot and unholy trinity, isn't it? Isn't there? The Holy Ghost is a spirit of truth. The false prophet is a spirit of lies, deception. The Holy Spirit will lead all men that Jesus is the way to God. The false prophet will convince the whole world that the Antichrist is the way to Satan, who will be the true God. So listen to what the false prophet does. You'll see it's that lying spirit. <coughs> Another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb. This is the ultimate wolf in sheep's clothing. Because he had horns like a lamb, not like a dragon. Horns like a lamb. This is the ultimate false prophet to deceive those that dwell on the earth. He had horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. A wolf with a sheep's heart. Uh, sorry, a sheep with a wolf's heart. A sheep with a lion's heart. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him and causeth the earth and them which dwell on the earth to worship the first beast, to worship the Antichrist. There needs to be a spirit in the world to deceive people so they'll worship the Antichrist. And he's working in the church. And he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire to come down from heaven in the sight of all men. Can you see how much of the church will be deceived if they're running round for signs and wonders? A man brings fire down from heaven and says, it's Elijah that was for to come. They're even singing now, aren't they? This is the spirit of Elijah. Well, Elijah has to come again, but can you see there's a false Elijah and he's going to bring fire down from heaven in the sight of all men. So Christians who are only on signs and wonders and not living a holy life will get deceived. This must be the real Christ. He's bringing fire down from heaven. And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of the miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, he doesn't want attention himself, this false prophet, does he? Just like the Holy Ghost won't speak of himself, he'll only point people to Christ. This anti-Holy Ghost, this false prophet, doesn't want recognition. It's saying to them that dwell on the earth, they should make an image to the beast, which had power by the sword and did live. So you know Nebuchadnezzar made a statue, didn't he? and said, bow down and worship it when you hear the music. That was only a prophecy of the one that's got to come. Did you know it's going to happen again, that there's going to be a statue? It says it. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. Now we're seeing a bit more. This statue is going to talk supernaturally. That the image of the beast should speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. 
and he causeth all, both great and small, rich and poor, to receive a mark in their forehead. Can you see our image, statues, and music is going to play a big part in the end days? That's why we've got a world academic uh, of music. And Babylonian music, Western music. Western music is, is, has pervaded the whole planet, do you know? It's funny, isn't it, that, that in the West we're not playing Chinese music. Well, I know there's nothing wrong with it, different scales than ours. We're not playing Jap Japanese music with the Himashito scales and all the different scales they've got, have we? We're playing Western music. You go to Beijing, they're playing European, American, Babylon rock. Because Babylon has filled the whole world. We're not playing other cultures of music. It's the West and Hollywood that's pervaded all the others. And you find that American mass production McDonald's, you can get one in Beijing, you can get one anywhere in the, on the planet. But you can also get the rock music because it's come from Babylon. It's the same statue. Do you remember the statue of gold and of silver and of bronze and of iron? Different dynasties, different empires. What people forget is it's the same statue. The legs of, of iron and the feet of clay that we're in now is not a different statue, it's the statue of Babylon. That statue is the statue of Babylon. Well, we're part of it. We're part of Babylon because it's the same statue. It's the statue of Babylon. And when the feet go, the whole statue comes down. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. But it's the feet that get hit with a stone. It's our generation, I believe, that'll get, that the Christ will come and destroy Babylon. And then the whole system falls down. And if you get the text, you'll find that all our culture, all the Western culture is Babylon. Babylon were the first empire to produce promissory notes for money. If you do mathematics, where does it come from? A Greek, the same statue, Pythagoras. Where does all our law come from? Roman law, the same statue, Babylon. It's the same statue. Babylon, Greece, Rome, to now. Our whole culture is based on Babylon. The church, where do you think they get the, the hat with the, the, the fish mite? It's Babylon. Where do you think they get the robes from? And all the things, it's from Babylon. The whole culture of finance, of economics, of politics. Democracy. Who made the word? Aristotle. And what did he say about democracy? Aristotle. He says democracy will only lead to dictatorship. It was a few thousand years ago, wasn't it? He knew. And all our culture and everything has come from that statue because we're in the West. And we've imported it to every nation of the world. The whole world is getting commercialised by the West Babylon. We're the statue. Come through that Roman Empire, through, through Babylon. I don't want to go into that, it's on the tapes. The other thing it says about Babylon... In Revelation, I'll, uh, Revelation 18, it says about this woman that she seduced the whole world by her sorceries. Do you know what word sorcery? It's a Greek word sorcery, isn't it? It means enchantment with drugs. That's what sorcery is. Witchcraft with drugs. Can you now understand why there's a world epidemic with drugs? Why is there a world, every, every big nation in the world has a drug problem? Because drugs are a key to Babylon. It said Babylon has seduced the whole world by her sorceries. Sorcery is enchantment with drugs. Not only heroin. Not only cocaine and crack and all, ecstasy and all those things. Did you know music is a drug? I've got a book by Simon, Simon Napier Bell, who's one of the long-standing rock producers, from Mark Bolan, if you can remember back to Mark Bolan and those, right through to boy, uh, not boy George, um, George Michael, he was his producer. He stood, he's 70 now, homosexual, and he stood the test of time through to Larry Payne's, Cliff Richards' manager who was a homosexual. Nearly all the pop managers were homosexual. Andrew Lou Golden, the Stones, he was homosexual. 
Brian Epstein, the Beatles manager, was, was homosexual. Homosexuality has a great part in modern music, you've no idea. The discos were started so men could dance together without getting arrested. That's why discos were started. You should learn about your culture and keep your kids away. Because it was started for gays, so they wouldn't get arrested, so men could dance close together and gyrate. I've got the book there, written by a non-Christian. I'm not, this is not Christian hype and scaremongering. This is written, it's called Black Music, White Powder. And this non-Christian is showing that every new um, style of music was born from drugs. Every new style started, the, the hip hop and the house music started with acid, didn't it, ecstasy. And every new style of music has been started by drugs. And this man, who's a non-Christian, who's a homosexual in the world, he said it's a known fact that one drug leads to another. And he says it's a known fact that music has a drugging effect on people. It gives you an altered state of consciousness. If you've ever gone in a disco or got lost in music, it changes your attitude from depression to joy, from whatever. But it's giving you an altered state of consciousness. And he said, for young people, music is the first drug they ever taste. And it leads on to others. So I'm not just, when I say about, oh, that by thy sorceries, I'm talking about all drugs. Because if you do transcendental meditation, you can get the same altered state of consciousness without the acid, without the chemicals. Doesn't matter which way you do it, whether you do it with chemicals or let demons in, it's the same thing. It's drugging your mind. It's taking you away from the living God. And the whole world's besotted. Be careful, Christians, what you take. Christians take far too many pills, don't you? If you get a headache, ask God what you're doing wrong, why you're living differently. Don't be like the world. Pain is there to tell you you're living wrong. That's why God put pain in your body. You're going to burn your hand if you keep it near the fire. That's good, isn't it? Pain is wonderful. It's to protect you. So when you get a headache, don't say, oh, where's the pills? Or get rid of the symptoms. Say, am I, am I, I eating too much cheese? Am I watching television? If you're watching Christian television to five o'clock every morning, you'll get a headache. And that's God telling you not to watch so much Christian television, good as it may be. Pain's there to protect you. Use it. Use pain to protect you. Don't be like the world. Far too many Christians have sleeping tablets and pills for this. If you're ill, I'm not, you, you realise I'm not talking about when you need them. But we think we need them, don't we? We're children of the living God. And the side effects from every little aspirin you take. Let your body fight it. God's put healing in your body. Don't aid it. Don't use the devil's techniques to aid it, will you? If it'll heal itself, if you break your arm, go and get it fixed. But be careful. Because Babylon's going to seduce the whole world through drugs, it says. Through sorceries, enchantment with drugs. I'm going to finish because there's, you know, ten hours in my head and, and I don't want to ramble, ramble on. Let me just pray for you here, we'll have a cup of coffee and then let, let's listen to Jeff, see what he has to say. I won't challenge you, I, I mean I preach, but uh, what do we do about it? Because I can see the explosion in music, can you? I can see the explosion in information, can you? I can see the cling film trapping the world, can you? So without scaremongering, I think it's time that we said, well, men, what shall we do? Surely I can do a bit more for God. Surely I can motivate myself a little bit more. I've not much time left. Lord, help us. We thank you, God, that you can speak to us. Lord, you don't need to thunder. You don't need to browbeat us, Lord. We're here because we want to hear from you. Lord, we didn't waste a Saturday to sit and meet nice people. Lord, we came because we need food. We need information from you, not from technology. We need the spirit of God, not the spirit of the world. Lord, will you please help us? We're hungry, Lord. Speak to us through Jeff, Lord, and challenge us. Amen.